Hey everybody, Scout Crafty here again. Uh, it's Wednesday. Doing this video a little bit earlier, just like I did uh, yesterday's uh, or Monday's video early because uh, I have a couple things to do this week and I have to get these videos out. So I have uh, some a couple cool things to talk about and uh, let's now, get right to it. The other day we were talking about lanterns and a good friend of the show, Alan Smith, had mentioned, he had said, uh, do you have any, you know anything about smudge pots? You know, he laughed because uh, when we were kids, uh, there was something called a smudge pot. And I said, oh yeah, do I know? I got a great story about smudge pots. But before I uh, tell you the story, let me uh, show you what they are. Okay, now technically, a smudge pot is a uh, orchard heater. And I have one of those too in the garage, in the uh, shed. That's really cool. And we use them at Jacktown and stuff. But uh, this here is what we commonly known as a, a smudge pot. But it's, a, it's really called a highway torch. Now, Prior to 1960, these were very common because they didn't have, you know, battery torches, things like that. They used to put these out when they were doing highway construction, things like that. They were very durable. They uh, required zero maintenance, you know, and basically what they were, a big uh, steel ball that you would fill up with the uh, kerosene and it, and it would run for, you know, days, you know, and uh, it would just pr produce a flame. They were a little bit sooty, a little bit dirty burning, and uh, the problem is that they were a little bit dangerous because, you know, you had an open flame here, and uh, and the flame was up, you know, sometimes three, four inches high, and the thing was uh, dangerous. I'll tell you my story later on on how dangerous these things could have been, but uh, they did away with them by, I guess, about in the city here, by about 1970, you know, mid-70, they were gone. You hardly saw them, but some private construction company still had a few of these around. Let me show you how it works. It's very simple. Now, uh, I'll show you the writing. First of all, if you could just see the writing, let me tilt you forward here and you can see the writing. If you look now, this is a Dietz number, uh, 87-1940. You could see on the cap, the burner cap here. And uh, you can see here, it says a uh, Dietz torch made in the USA. You can see that there. And if you're flipping around, it says use kerosene only, use kerosene only. And, um, how this worked, it was quite, you know, like I said, very simple. And what you would do is, uh, this burner cap would come off. This would protect it from rain and wind. And there was a big wick in there. And when I say a big wick, you know, look at the size of this wick here. And you can see here now how old this is, right? By the way, this wick is kind of falling apart, but um, there it is. And you would trim this wick the same way you would any other wick and, you know, pull it through and then cut it off a little bit. But that's all there is to it. And then you would fill this with kerosene, let it saturate, and then it would burn. And uh, we'll light this up. I'm just not going to light it down the basin because it it's a little sooty. I don't want any smoke protectors going off, so we'll bring this outside. It's a pretty nice night, but before we do, let me show you something now, else. In the 40s and 50s, just like that uh, smudge pot uh, years ago, when if uh, in order to uh, operate trucks on the highways, because they weren't so well lit and things like that, you had to have some kind of a uh, marking device if you broke down so that other cars wouldn't run into you. And these were called highway or truck flares. And um, here you can see it says uh, truck flare. Okay, let me tilt you forward again so you can see it. And it says, uh, and you can see here, uh, Gangway made this. It's called a uh, number 600 truck flare. And you can see it's K&D lamp, Cincinnati, Ohio, USA. Okay. Uh, these were very similar to, they would usually come I, they, legally. Sometimes you had to have three of them. It depends on the code or the state. But um, some of these would come in a kit, and I have other kits that have them. They would come with this little uh, thing. You could put a, a flag on here during the daytime, but at night you would light up the you know, the, the torch. And again, this would fill with kerosene. Let me show you how it opens. This cap comes off. You could see this is NOS, new old stock, never used. Uh, this would twist off like this and come up. That's your little burner cap. And here was your wick assembly. Now, this is what the wick is supposed to look like when it's new. You can see it's a nice braided wick. And, and again, new old stock. Again, the loss of value if this gets lit one time. And once again, we will light this up outside. So let's fill these two up with kerosene. Bring them upstairs and see what they look like. Okay. 
Okay, it's about 36 degrees out here, windy, rainy. It's a perfect day to demonstrate and see how these work if they do. I'm gonna try and light this. I never lit it before. Okay, that one lit right up. Uh, let's go to the NOS one here. See if this one lights up. Okay, we got that lit. First time ever. Okay, now you can see, I'm taking the flashlight off now. And you can see this is about as windy as it gets out here that you're in normal condition. Winds are about 20 miles an hour sustained. And uh, you can see that they, uh, they do perform. Now these would be left out either by the roadside or on the left if you uh, broke down, you would put them out. And you can see they do throw off a, a good amount of light and uh, very interesting to look at. Now, let me tell you the story about the one on the right here. Uh, when I was a kid, uh, what I did was we were, they had one of these on a construction right around the corner from me, right around the corner. They had a hole they dug and they had this on the pit of dirt. And uh, we were looking at it because we were fascinated. I was about 10 years old. This was about 1972. And uh, I was looking at this saying, wow, that's, that's cool. And then a bus, the bus passes by the, uh, that street. And uh, as the bus was passing by, I don't know what made me do it. I just kicked <laughs> the ball underneath the bus. I don't know why I did it, but I just did. And when I did, the corner of the tire caught the, the Dietz ball and sent it 30 feet into the air down the block. And it bounced and rolled and it looked like a Roman candle. It was amazing. But then it rolled under a car, and uh, because these are self-riding and it didn't go out, it rolled and it fell under the car and it started burning. I said, oh, and we started running, but then I realized that that car would go on fire. So I had to run back and I picked up a board, knocked it out from underneath the car and put it back on the dirt pile. And I'll tell you, that was the stupidest thing. Well, one of the stupidest things I ever did. Anyway, pretty interesting light, the Dietz and the little highway torch in the uh, windiest of conditions. So as you can see, I think highway torches are, are really amazing. And uh, there's a guy out in California, his name is Steve. And uh, I'm gonna put a link to his video. If you ever wanted to know anything about any highway barricades, barricade lights, torches, I'm gonna put a link to uh, Steve's um, torch, highway torch video. And that'll show you everything you need to know about these uh, these lovely little uh, kerosene torches. And uh, so I, I, I wish you would check it out. I think you really enjoy it. That, he's out in Southern California. He has some of the best collection you ever saw. Okay, next up. Uh, Real quick, remember we were straightening out that box the other day for Dan and uh, my buddy 805 Road King said, with all them hammers you have, you don't have a uh, body hammer? And I do. It's just that uh, I wasn't using it for that because uh, I, let me show you, you know, one. I have a few body hammers and uh, all different types. And uh, this one here is a, a, a dedicated type body hammer. And you can see uh, body hammers are a little bit different in the way they're formed. And, and the way is they have a, usually a nice flat. This one here is a slight convex to it. You can see here it's not totally flat, slight convex. And that's so you don't leave rings around uh, what you're hitting. And it also has another side here. And uh, this is so you can uh, bang out small dents along the way. So, and it has a fiberglass handle. This one's made by Nupler. Uh, you can see here, Nupler says lifetime fiberglass handles. But let me tell you one thing about this company, okay? Uh, I have a few Nupler hammers, a bunch of soft blow hammers, things like that. But uh, a lifetime warranties to me mean nothing if you can't get in touch with them. And I tried to contact this company, not for a warranty issue. I was going to ask them a question about purchasing one of their hammers, they would not return my call. So as far as I'm concerned, uh, their lifetime warranty is useless because like I said, if you can't get in touch with the company, no matter writing, calling, what, forget it. Then, you know, so that's what, how I feel about Nupla. Maybe somebody else has a better, uh, uh, you know, experience with them, but I could not get in contact with them. So their warranty to me is, is pretty much useless, but it is a nice hammer, and that's a, a body Okay, hammer. last up, uh, a couple weeks ago, I was doing a video, and it was raining heavy outside, and I had some water coming in through my electrical service, and it freaked a lot of you people out, and, uh, and rightly so. 
water and electricity don't seem to go too well. And uh, I want to show you uh, what's going on and, and uh, what has happened. I've, I've called Con Ed and, and a few things, but let's talk a little bit about uh, about what how your electricity gets to you and why this now, might before happen. Before we start, this is a uh, something I would teach all my scouts before we were going on a hike or something. This is something all of them would have to know because if ever you came across a downed wire or something like that, as and as scouts, we're kind of first responders, and you'd have to know what if it was dangerous or not dangerous or whatever the case is. So here is a typical uh, telephone pole, the anatomy of a telephone pole. If you look at it here, you have this cross member that goes across the top of the telephone pole and there's usually three wires that run across the very top. And those are your very high uh, voltage wires leading from the, uh, you know, your transfer stations. And, and these usually run about 7,200 volts or more each. And uh, they're, so they're very high voltage. These are the ones that are extremely dangerous here and they're, they're all hot. Uh, a little bit below it here, you might have a little box you could see here. And that little box might be a, uh, uh, an electric uh, a fuse of more or less that if the pole gets struck by lightning it will disconnect it and uh, so you might see something like that it might have wires going to it something like there uh, a little below that you'll see a wire that comes down here and that wire is usually a neutral and that's your basic neutral for all the wires here that run back to the station now as the wires come down so does the voltage now, when you get down here, you'll see a little tra uh, a little transformer. You'll see this on the poles. And this is what's called a step-down transformer. And this transformer takes this high voltage from these top wires, and it, it drops it down to 240 or 120 volts, which is what we use in the house. Uh, from there, you can see it's tapped off these all these wires. These There'll be three or four wires that run here, and those will all be uh, the house wires, 240 or 120. And... Now, this is where it gets funny, because in my house here, when uh, on the telephone pole, it will tap off these three wires here, or four, and that will come either two ways into your house. Now, for most people that have overground service, that'll come, and the wires will just come like this and come right to your house. And then from there, you deal with it through uh, what's called a weatherhead. Uh, for me... The wires are underground from the pole, so what happens is these wires come into a pole here, and you'll see this little tube here, and what they usually do is they'll fill this with uh, like a beeswax or something to stop the leakage. Now, uh, under these wires, this one here, this one will be usually a telephone wire, and that's usually about 50 volts. Remember, I said the voltage gets lower. And then the last wire that you'll see on the bottom, usually a very thick wire or a couple wires, that's your cable TV or uh, Fios or something like that. So that's all, you know, very low voltage. So as you can see, the lower it gets, the safer it gets. But here's the situation now. Let's talk about how it gets into the... Uh, the hole here, the pole. Now, remember I said that these uh, 120 or 240 lines that will come into my house here through this little pole that has uh, no weatherhead on top. Now, that's what I was always, and no drip loop. Now, normally when you put a, uh, when you put wires going into your house, you have something called a weatherhead. A weatherhead is something that looks like a, uh, nothing more than an elbow. It's, it used to be made of cast iron. Now they can make them out of uh, uh, plastic or all kinds of things. But what they do is they protect the lines from having snow and water and things like that going into the pole that holds your wire. And uh, it does a, a great job in protecting it. But And I never understood why the poles, the telephone poles, do not have a weatherhead out here. And there must be a reason for it. I just don't know why. So the, the wires come directly from here down into this this uh, uh, opening into a pole and uh, it creates a problem you know it could it, obviously the water flows down here and goes into that pole and then it comes out through my service you know or and unless they seal this really good so uh, you could see there's different types of uh, like we were talking different types of weather heads why they don't have that or a drip loop and uh, you could see the ones in front of my house here uh, these poles look a little different now here is the pole in front of my directly in front of my house where I get my electricity from and you can see there we're getting all that cable mess at the bottom. If you look up here, look closely, you'll see that's where the electricity comes into the pipe that leads into my house. And you can see looking closely 
What a, uh, you know, water could drip right there. No drip loop, no weather head right into that slot. Now, this is my neighbor's pole, brand new. They just put it in. You could actually see the old pole. They cut it and they're transferring the lines little by little, but it's a brand new pole. And look at their service where it leads into their house. You could see. Um, you have two units getting in there and two different pipes and look if you look close you could see the kind of the beeswax or whatever they melt around there no weather head so I'm wondering uh, I know there's a lot of electricians and uh, uh, there are a lot of really smart people that that watch these videos I was wondering why they don't put a weather head or some other device to stop the moisture from going into those poles other than melting beeswax or something into the one end I there's got to be a reason and uh, maybe you know, but I don't, and uh, I'm far from an electrician. But anyway, uh, I hope that uh, helps out and explains why uh, sometimes you might have that problem of water coming in or, or something like that. So anyway, thanks very much for tuning in. I hope you have a nice day. Take care now. Bye-bye.